Minoru Hayashi had neither time nor money on his side. Race car driver and colleague Tojiro Ukiya approached him with the idea of transforming his Honda S600 into a full-blooded circuit thoroughbred for the Suzuka Clubman race. The water-cooled Honda might have been a spirited performer in its own right, but it wouldn't be able to stack up to the other machines on the grid without some changes. The duo needed to do some serious work to the convertible to get it up to spec. Therein lay the problem. They could only spare 60,000 yen for the project. According to Hayashi, this was equivalent to about 170 US dollars at the time. To make their meager resources stretch, they'd have to forego expensive powertrain modifications and take another approach. The strategy now was to add lightness. Reducing weight and improving aerodynamics became their top priorities. These goals also went in hand with Hayashi's interest in glass-reinforced plastics. He didn't have a proper workspace and had to design the parts out of a few settings. A friend allowed him to operate out of his place for a bit, but then realized how big of a mistake it was. He sent Hayashi packing. After working out of the back of a pickup truck, he moved into his own home. Even more problems emerged. His father was a seasoned artist and was none too pleased to find that the material had made its way onto his paintings. The two of them butted heads over this matter. It was a bleak situation, but he had nowhere else to go. Hayashi persevered through these difficulties and got the parts finished, and not a moment too soon. The Klutman race was right around the corner. There was just one problem. They didn't consider how they were going to attach the parts to the car. Ukiya had an idea. He took the fiberglass panels and quite literally drilled them into the bodywork. Hayashi was acquainted with Hirotoshi Honda, the son of Soichiro Honda and the future founder of Mugen. He suggested that they give it a black finish, not unlike that of a fighter plane. So they bought paint cans from the store and applied the stuff with brushes. The final car hardly resembled the Spry Roadster it started out as. In its new life, it would be known as the Karasu, which is the Japanese term for crow. With its flat black exterior and pointed nose, it fit the car like a glove. But how would it fear in competition? The results spoke for themselves. With the Ukiya behind the wheel, the Karasu won its very first race, and it was thanks in large part to their resourcefulness, determination, and unconventional thinking. As momentous an occasion as this was, it was only the beginning. A few weeks after winning the Suzuka Clubman race, Tojiro Ukiya tragically lost his life during a practice run. Minoru Hayashi was developing another car around this time, he renamed it the Tojiro II in honor of his deceased friend. Close friends and family celebrated his life at the course later that evening. A portrait of him was even drawn on the hood. Hayashi established Makransa in the mid-60s. This was a constructor that built a number of cars, including the Kusabi and Panic. While he had a burning passion for car building, it was ultimately a money pit. It had never been a particularly lucrative endeavor, but he had reached his breaking point. Something had to give. At the age of 26, Minoru Hayashi stepped away from the industry and took a well-deserved reprieve in Kyoto. Don't think of this as an all-out retirement, but rather a hiatus. Hayashi grew bored with his new lifestyle and longed for a return to car building. In 1975, he embarked on a new venture. In early 1975, Minoru Hayashi established Kabushiki Gaisha Domu. Domu literally translates to child's dream, and considering Hayashi's end goal, it was an appropriate name. Race car construction might not have been in the cards, but perhaps he might have better luck with road vehicles. He and his team set out to develop, build, and sell their very own model, the Zero. While a return to the track could have been a possibility in the distant future, he was focused entirely on seeing this project through. Dome started in a section of the Hayashi Racing Headquarters. There was a blood bond between the two firms. Minoru's cousin Shoichi established the company, which was a race car constructor at the time. It was probably best known for its iconic wheels though. Dome's name may have alluded to her dream, but the Zero's development process was nothing short of a nightmare. The work consumed its employees. 
They moved from their homes to hotels near the factory. Their duties left them with very little free time. They could hardly even spare a moment to bathe. Some even saw their wives leave them. They sacrificed their well-being and their relationships because they knew what was at stake. Dome only had one chance to make a strong first impression. If they succeeded, then perhaps they'd live to see another day. If the car didn't catch on with the public immediately, then the results would have been cataclysmic. Minoru Hayashi had years of experience designing race machines, but creating a production car came with its own unique challenges. A Hemmings article has an excerpt from the series, A Quiet Greatness, Japan's Most Astonishing Automobiles for the Collector and Enthusiast. One passage details some of the roadblocks that the team encountered, which included creating the bodywork itself, crafting the massive front screen, and ironing out the bugs in the retractable headlights. Masao Ono led styling efforts, while Hayashi gave additional input. Together, they made a car that was very much in the mold of the quote-unquote door stops that were so prominent in the 70s and 80s, and it's a largely successful effort. Impact bumpers usually spoil designs, but the one at the front of the Zero accentuates the form by drawing it out to a defined point. One can almost draw a straight line from it to the top of the windshield, the myriad vids around the body are sheathed in black paint. This ties them together so that we can treat them as a single element. The dark graphic goes through the six openings on the hood, into the top of the wheel well, across the lower half of the side, and up just past the crease. It stops the head of the shoulder vent before continuing across the C-pillar. This effect does not extend to the roof. The aforementioned crease spans the entire length of the body and also defines the upper edge of the rear wheel well. There is more than a bit of Gandini flavor here. It loses the green highlight as it wraps around the back. Glass is an integral part of the overall design. Below the side window lies a thin slot that opens the greenhouse up and counters the low cabin. Buttresses made of the stuff sit behind the pillars. They work with the windows and windshield to extend the glass area and give the illusion of one large sweeping screen. In some situations, the buttresses catch reflections and give the Zero another dimension. The rear bumper isn't as tied in with the design as the one on the front. From certain angles, it doesn't look too bad. From others, mainly side views, one can see its true relationship with the other elements. It isn't just that it's sticking out, but how it's sticking out. There isn't any cohesion with the car. It's there solely because it has to be. Occupants would have to navigate across thick side stilts to get inside, and once they did, they'd find themselves in an angular, minimalist cockpit. The passenger side was completely barren. Everything was placed around the driver. A digital IP sat behind a custom Hayashi Racing steering wheel. The main housing held the speedometer and tachometer, while two clusters underneath relayed various other metrics. Controls for the lights, hazards, and wipers can be found on a panel jutting from the IP. Dome made a statement with both the exterior and interior. The mechanicals were a bit more grounded. Powering the Zero was the L28E from the Nissan 280ZX. It provided reasonably strong performance while being readily available and easy to work on. In this application, it made 145 horsepower and 166 pound-foot of torque. Those numbers might not sound very impressive, but the Zero weighed a touch over 2,000 pounds. That amount of juice was enough to give it healthy performance figures, as we'll soon find out. Dome also sourced the steering column from the Honda Accord, the door pulls from the Toyota Celica, and the brake calipers from the Subaru Leon. Hayashi and his team had wrapped development up by 1978, but the trials were far from over. Now they'd have to display the Zero in front of thousands of showgoers in Geneva. Dome's fate was now in the hands of the public. So how do they take to it? Quite well, in fact. There weren't too many other high-profile debuts at this show, as far as I could tell, so the Zero had much of the spotlight to itself. The company also received 20 pre-orders on the spot. This would give the emerging automaker an early boost, provided that the certification process went well. The wider effect of the show wouldn't be felt until the team got back to Japan. A toy company wanted to license the Zero in a merchandising deal. As per the agreement, 
Dome would receive 4 million yen in exchange for the blanket rights. Negotiations dragged on, and other offers poured in before the contract could be signed. This put the automaker in an advantageous position. Instead of selling the rights to a single party, they could now dole them out on an individual basis. Companies produced almost anything you could think of, including RC cars, die-cast models, t-shirts, coats, posters, pencil cases, erasers, and keychains. Hayashi said that sales at the time were over 400 million yen. He also said that the company might not be around today if it took that initial offer. Just when things seemed to be going well, Dome reached an impasse. Japan had strict regulations on its cars. Established automakers had enough trouble meeting them. Dome, a company that hadn't even gotten a vehicle on the road, had a Herculean task ahead of itself. It spent more than a year engaged in a tug-of-war with the country's Ministry of Transport, but the effort was in vain. Dome washed its hand of the situation. The Zero would have to remain a dream. Or would it? So, the Zero couldn't meet Japanese regulations, but perhaps it could get the go-ahead in another market. The United States is remembered to have had draconian rules back then, but Dome believed that it had a better shot of getting approved there. The company also established a US subsidiary and even took steps to produce them there. Customers in Japan could then import them through the gray market, bypassing the regs that had given them so much trouble in the past. Of course, this meant that the design had to be tweaked for the new model, which was known as the P2. The bumpers were no doubt the biggest change on the outside. They jut out even more than before. Overall design cohesion suffers as a result. The front bumper doesn't carry the momentum of the angular bodywork. Instead, it comes to a dead stop once the sections meet. And instead of coming to a defined point, the bumper just… ends. It's like it hits a brick wall. The reworked rear end only magnifies the issues that the old one had. In general, the P2 was bigger than its predecessor. It grew 250 millimeters in overall length, while the wheelbase was about 50 millimeters longer. The P2 was also 5 millimeters wider and 10 millimeters taller. Dome changed the doors as well. They went straight up on the initial car. On the P2, the doors raced diagonally. Interior space was improved slightly thanks to the enlarged exterior dimensions. It also had a few more creature comforts. Temperature and radio controls were within reach of both the driver and passenger in the center of the dash. Dome reworked the IP. Various indicators flanked a larger speed readout. Above all of this lies a digital tachometer. The P2's button panel shrunk and the gear shifter moved to the center. The latter item has a more unusual design that fits with the cockpit aesthetically but looks to be less usable overall. Dome built a pair of P2s. One was painted red while the other had a lime green finish. In 1979, they were shown at both the Chicago Auto Show and the Los Angeles Auto Expo. Rodentrek then secured one of the cars and detailed its impressions in September. The magazine acknowledged that, while the styling didn't break any new ground, it was well done overall. It even compared it favorably to the vaunted Lamborghini Countach. Overall fit and finish was also exceptional. Road and Track stated that it was better constructed than some production cars that they had looked at. The interior was a mixed bag. As a six-footer, rider Dennis Simonitis could fit into the car, though he wasn't comfortable. He said the car would not accommodate those over 5'8". Rather, they'd have to accommodate to the car. Dome said that the production model would have more space inside, with lower seats and smaller door sills. The offbeat gear lever also earned some of their ire. Visibility was about as bad as you might expect. Simonitis couldn't make out very much from the rear quarters and had to rely on the side mirrors more than he would have liked. Roden Track recorded a 0 to 60 time of 7.6 seconds and a quarter mile time of 16.1 seconds at 88 miles an hour. What's more, Dome said that these numbers could go even lower. The test car had hardly been broken in. The company claimed that it achieved a quarter mile time of 14.5 seconds with a different car, 
which would have bested the Countach by a hair. The end of the article stated that the first 30 cars were set to go on sale in early 1980 at an estimated price of about $60,000. This all hinged on the car getting through the certification process. The magazine did express concern that it would not meet the impact height requirements of 16 to 20 inches. It suggested that the company fit the zero with springs that increased its height to pass and then immediately settled to their intended position. In any case, the company still had time to get this issue and others sorted. And then, nothing. Dome just couldn't get the car to pass. Production felt agonizingly close, but it became clear that this was the end of the road for the Zero. As this chapter of Dome's history closed, another was just being written. Before getting into the next part, I'd like to state that because of the language barrier, I'm not 100% sure about the following events. From what I can gather, a toy company that Dome had worked with in the past wanted them to make another model. Specifically, they wanted a Zero race car. The firm even offered to give Dome an advance payment. Hayashi didn't have much interest in that and instead suggested a dedicated Le Mans car. The toy company loved the idea. Years after leaving the circuit behind, Hayashi was back in the fire. Ono led design work in this car as well, which was known as the Zero RL. That acronym was short for Racing Le Mans. Dome specifically focused on its speed and aerodynamics so that it could take full advantage of the straightaways. The RL was over 16 feet long. The front track was also 52.7 inches across. According to Motorsport Magazine, this was about 7 inches narrower than other cars in its classification. Other aspects of the RL caused some concern. Vague steering and general instability at high speeds made racing more interesting than Dome may have intended. The RL was also originally designed with a glass bubble canopy. While it preserved visibility in aero, it also made the cabin uncomfortably warm. The wind that entered the cockpit lashed at the drivers and created severe vibrations. Dome later removed it. Work wrapped up just three months after development started. The company built two cars. Both were powered by the Cosworth DFV V8, but made different power figures. The first, which we'll refer to as Car 6, made 450 horsepower and weighed about 1,730 pounds. The second, Car 7 made 415 horsepower and weighed about 1,744 pounds. Roughly a month out from the 1979 24 Hours of Le Mans, Dome tried its luck at the Silverstone 6 hours. While the straights here weren't as long, the RL could still get a leg up on the competition through them. It would need to keep pace with the likes of the Porsche 934, 935, and 911 Carrera RSR. This was Dome's first attempt at a race, and the RL was its first competition machine. It's safe to say that a win wasn't likely. The most it could reasonably hope for was a strong first impression. They sure gave the heavyweights a scare in qualifying. Dome finished with the third best time, coming behind a pair of Porsches. If they could place highly, then perhaps they could carry that momentum into Le Mans. Unfortunately, Dome fell back down to earth the RL finished 12th out of 13. While this result was crushing, they could at least take solace in the fact that they actually managed to complete the race. Now the question was whether or not it could survive the grueling 24 hours of Le Mans. Earning the third place in the grid at Silverstone at least gave Dome a bit of confidence going into the main event. A similar result was in store on the track that the RL was designed to carve up, right? Well, Cars 6 and 7 earned the 15th and 18th positions in qualifying, respectively. At this point, even a podium finish seemed out of reach. They would have been satisfied if they were able to get through it in one piece. Dome was on track to do much more than that. Car 7 had broken from the pack and found itself in 5th place an hour into the race. It was still early, but if the car could maintain its pace or Heck, even when the event outright, then Dome's racing program would gain legitimacy from the press as well as other clubs. This only made what came next that much more gut-wrenching. 
engine issues forced it to pit. It might have lost its place in the standings, but it probably wasn't the end of the world considering how it navigated the field beforehand. The car got back into the action, though the gremlins cropped up once again. A blown head gasket sealed its fate just three hours into the race. Car 6 fared even worse, lasting just 25 laps before being forced to retire. And that was that. Months of back-breaking work and preparation undone in mere hours. Dome could only head back to Japan and regroup for next year's event. The club returned with the redesigned RL80 and a year of experience. It earned the seventh spot on the grid, but the mechanical issues became the undoing once again. The gearbox filled soon after the race started. You might think Dome would have retired, but Hayashi couldn't bear to see an early exit two years in a row. They had the car repaired at a local shop and got it back on the circuit. It didn't matter that they were dead last. Finishing the race at all was an achievement in itself. Dome became the first Japanese entrant to complete the 24 Hours of Le Mans. The Sigma MC74 Mazda participated in 1974, but the result was not classified because it did not complete the minimum required laps. Dome may have made history in 1980, but its financial outlook seemed uncertain going into 81. Roland, the team's major sponsor up to this point, pulled its support. It appeared as if their days on the racetrack were behind them. Amada, a machine tool company, stepped in and ensured that Dome would at least compete at Le Mans that season. Even with the upgraded RL81, the team earned yet another DNF. Dome got thrown for a loop in 82. Group 5 and Group 6 classifications were dissolved, and Group C regulations took their place. Hayashi wanted to adapt the existing design to the new rules, though, because of his dwindling resources, he was limited in how far he could go. Dome outsourced the work to, in his own words, the cheapest body shop in the UK. Sometime after handing the assignment down, he flew out to the workshop to see how things were getting on. Rather than a team of engineers, Hayashi encountered one man toiling away at the car. Dome had concerns about whether the RC82 would be finished in time. Surprisingly, the UK firm kept a schedule. The team came to the Silverstone six hours with years of racing experience as well as a more powerful car, but it didn't matter. Driver Chris Kraft got 116 laps deep before being forced to retire. Things were trending in the wrong direction, heading into Le Mans. Its showing there was somehow both disappointing and expected. The RC82 lasted a mere 85 laps. The Zero's long tilt descendants weren't much longer for this world. Dome, on the other hand, continued to endure. It deepened its ties with Toyota, developed its own engineering facilities, and became a respected firm both domestically and abroad. And if it weren't for those previous trials, they would not be prepared to take on those challenges. It's amazing what's possible when one dares to dream.